Hi guys, and welcome to linear regression. So we've just finished up correlation and we've had a good discussion um, thinking about significance, effect size, and data screening. So let's make that bigger and move on to multiple predictors, right? So first off, what is regression? Well, it's a way of uh, predicting our dependent variable or Y or our criterion from other variables. And so this forces a direction on the cause that we think happens. With correlation, we can't really pick a side. We can't say this one causes that one without running an experiment. But we often think that there is one that is likely the reason. And with regression, we can at least hypothesize that direction by making one of them a predictor and one of them a criterion. So again, we're making models. So it's a hypothetical model of the relationship between two or more variables to one dependent variable. If you want multiple dependent variables, that's a completely different analysis. And in this example, we're gonna focus on linear regression, but it doesn't have to be linear. You could be curvilinear. We can make quadratic equations. So um, while the focus uh, of this class is on traditional parametric statistics. We could do non-parametric statistics that don't require linearity. And so we'll make our equation, our regression line, be straight. And we'll use the mathematical formula for our model that um, forces that line to be straight. And so here's what that is. Let's make this a little bigger. There we go. So we have y sub i here, meaning each person's individual uh, score, b0 or b0, b1, x, which is um, each person's individual score on the predictor variable, plus some sort of error term. So let's walk through these one at a time. What is b sub i? Meaning b0 or b1 or b2 or b3, they can, there can be more. And it's often considered the regression coefficient for that predictor. And a regression coefficient in more mathematical terms is the slope of a regression line. And this is mostly B1, B2, B3, B0, or B0 is a little bit different. And what that slope tells us as a model is the direction and strength of a relationship. Or have you heard that before? That comes from our correlation section. And so it tells us if it's positive or negative, do they go up together as one go up, the other goes down, and how strong. Now with correlation, that was bounded, meaning it could only go from negative one to one. But with regression, this idea of how strong is in the scale of the data. So we always have to pay attention to what our predictors are because how strong for one variable might be 0.2, and for another variable with the same strength, that might be seven. So it just depends on the scale again of the data. Now B zero specifically is the Y intercept. This is the value or the average of Y when any X in the equation is zero. Because if you don't know any predictors, what's a good model? Well, that's where we started this year. If I have no information about any other variables, the best model for a variable is often the mean. So this value is y average when x is zero, meaning when x is not known, it doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. Now, there are many times where theoretically x doesn't ever equal zero. So we say we had those teacher evaluation scales that run from one to seven. Well, x is literally never zero. But this is conceptually when x isn't there, right? It is the intercept. But practically from your other math classes, this is also the point at which the regression line crosses y. Now for x variables that can be negative, this is when x is literally zero. So just to get an idea here where um, we have our y-intercept here, and we might have several different kinds of scenarios. Well, so we have multiple predictors in our variable and our equation here, not just B1, but also B2 in this case, or B3. Now variables can have the same intercept um, and different slopes or the same slope and different intercepts or both. 
But in our equations, we're gonna force ourselves to have one intercept and they can kind of change their slopes depending on, on um, what's happening with the variable. So with regression, we can, and we'll come back to that equation and talk more about all the different pieces of it, but we'll mostly wanna focus on um, starting with the model here. And our model we're really gonna be interested in is the slope, okay? Because the slope tells us if that variable is predictive or not. Okay? Our other pieces to the equation um, is the error. And so this should not sound um, new to you now, but our, our hypothesis test is model over error, right? And signal to noise. And so we'll look at that slope over the error. And we'll talk specifically once we get into um, how the regression uh, is calculated, what the error term is in this kind of model. So for each person here in this equation, y sub i, that's each person, their score is represented by the entire equation, right? It's the average of y plus the, uh, the weighted x score, their weighted predictor, the slope times x for that independent variable for that person, plus a little bit of error. We never get everybody exactly right. So sometimes we, are, we guess too high, sometimes we guess too low, but this equation is our model of, of each person's score. So we can use the entire thing as the model and we could also use each um, individual slope as a model. So there'll be multiple kind of questions, hypoth uh, hypothesis questions, statistical questions that we can ask during a regression where we focus on the whole thing as a model or just one little component as a model. And we'll talk about when you would use each one once we start looking at some numbers. And so what kinds of things can I do with regression? Like what are their types, right? So you'll see sometimes people talk about simple linear regression and that's where you have one X and one Y. And this is a, essentially correlation okay? where, where we've standard, if we standardize the entire thing, we end up with the correlation. Okay? So with simple linear regression, if you standardize it, you end up with correlation. We've already done that chapter. So now we're gonna focus on multiple linear regression. This is where you have two or more X variables, but still only one Y. And there are a couple of types of multiple linear regression. First main type, the most common type I would say is simultaneous. This is where you use your predictors all at once. And so you throw it at the wall and you see what sticks. There's also hierarchical where you can do your prediction in steps. Okay. So you can say, okay, well, I wanna try these predictors, then add these next predictors and then add these others. And the usefulness of that allows you to think about the additive or combination value of your predictors, given that you've already tried some. And generally this is used as, I want to adjust for or control for these known um, confound variables or these known differences in people before I start and then see if my predictor is useful. And so we'll also practice a hierarchical example. That is often confused with what's called stepwise or statistical regression. And the way that stepwise regression works is it mathematically selects the hierarchical steps for you. And so you put in all of your variables and it picks the best variables first. Now, while that sounds like a brilliant idea because then I don't have to think very hard, that can be a bit capricious. Right? And so sometimes it, it capitalizes on the chance in your data. So without very, very large samples, a stepwise regression might say, these are the important predictors just because they're very close, um, close to each other in their prediction. And then in the next sample, it'll give you something totally different. And so generally most in most social sciences, maybe not in analytics, like business analytics, right? Uh, people say you should focus on hierarchical because you have the control, right? And you know what you're using to predict 
But if you have thousands of predictors and you just want to know which ones happen to work in that sample, a stepwise regression will help you um, with data reduction, meaning reducing down to only ones that are useful. You just have to be careful of multicollinearity when you have that many predictors. So there are there are times and places for stepwise regression, um, but here we're going to mostly focus on simultaneous and hierarchical. Because if you can do a hierarchical regression, you can do a stepwise regression. So when we go to analyze the regression, I just kind of hinted at this, but there are several models that we could consider. So the first one is, is my overall model, the equation, okay, all of the predictors at once useful at predicting the outcome? Can I guess a person's or data points score on my dependent variable with everything I have? Okay. And what that turns out to be is what's called an F test. So this is a ratio of signal to noise when you have um, um, many variables. Okay. We've, we've mostly only seen T so far. And in our model summary, that tells me basically if my effect size or my prediction is better than zero. And we'll use R squared as our effect size in this scenario. And so this answers this question, does the entire equation predict better than nothing? And that's one model we can use. Another model that we could use is looking at each predictor individually because the entire equation could predict. So let's say you have four predictors and you say, okay, all four of these together predict better than, than, better than nothing. But then, you know, is it all four of them that are predicting or is it just one of them carrying the weight like your traditional class group project, right? There's one person who does all the work. And so this is sort of a follow-up question where I can look at the coefficient. This is the slope right, B1, B2, B3. This turns out to be a t-test. And we can use partial R squared to determine if that predictor is uh, a useful predictor. And so this answers the question of which one predicts. So if my overall model is useful, which one is it <laughs> that is useful? The answer might be all of them, or in some very rare scenarios, <laughs> very rare, it could be none of them, where overall, all together combined, they predict something small, but maybe important, but individually, they're contributing so little, they don't seem important. And this is why effect size is so useful, because it allows us to really think about that outside of p-values. So speaking of p-values, let's talk about the null hypothesis test that is traditionally used with, with regression here. Okay, so uh, our overall model is an F test. And we're gonna touch briefly on F here and how this works, but we're really gonna spend more time talking about F tests when we get to ANOVA, even though regression is technically the name of this class, right? This class says general linear model. We're doing least squares. This is the math is the same all semester, <laughs> but it is a little easier to understand F once you get to ANOVA as we kind of break down what's happening in the math. So we'll kind of save that for a couple chapters from now, but know that an F test is that same signal to noise that we've been talking about all semester. It just handles signal to noise when there are multiple variables. Okay, T tests handle more scenarios where we have two groups or the correlation, for example, um, or a single predictor. So we're really handling maybe one or two things. ANOVA works better when we're handling three or more things. And overall though, I can think about this hypothesis test being where my null hypothesis is that we can't predict the dependent variable. This is really easy. You know, my independent variables do not predict the dependent variable. And I could actually use this all semester. It just, um, helps to be more specific when we're talking about um, groups, right? There, there are no group differences, but basically that is the same thing as saying, I can't predict <laughs> why there are group differences, right? Um, 
our alternative hypothesis is that we can predict the dependent variable. Now this is very vague and um, you should be more specific. So let's say I'm trying to predict your class scores. I might say I can't use, um, you know, uh, let's see, time spent studying and a uh, number of quiz questions gotten correct to predict scores. So you should say uh, what you can and can't predict. <laughs> this is a little vague, but that's the basic concept. We can't predict whatever the DV is and we can't predict it. And so generally we're not gonna use what's called a one-tailed test where we pick a side. So we don't often say in this scenario, like I can, can't predict above 0.15 or R squared is above 0.15. Now you can, this is a test you can run. It's just that people don't. <laughs> so if you have a specific effect size you're looking for, you generally calculate the effect size and just kind of look at it. Um, so there isn't really room for one tail tests here. Okay. Partially because the F test has no negative values. So you take that t-test, t-distribution, which is generally considered a normal distribution with enough folks in it, right? It's, it, it becomes z over time. So take that t-test, square it, and you end up with f. And so by squaring that, our f-test is always positive, much like regression. So it's kind of hard to do a two-tailed test because there is only one tail in f, okay, because we squared it. And so we don't we don't tend to do this sort of test um, where we'll where we'll say you know I expect my prediction to be greater than something. Okay. That is a test that I can do, but is not normal. But what do I mean by predict? Okay. Well, we got our equation here, right? And we're trying to predict each person's y score. So they're um, the little I here just remembers what participant it is, so to speak. Okay. And so we'll calculate our mean score of Y if X is zero. So that's B naught, B zero, right? Add any influence of our predictive variables by multiply, getting a weighted X score. So multiplying the slope times X, their actual score on that variable. And then accounting for any differences in the actual score um, and our predicted score. So if you see, ever see one with a little hat on it, it's the predicted score. Okay. And that is the error. Okay. So our error term here, our residuals, is simply the difference between your actual score and the score I predicted for you. And these will become very important because they're going to be what we're going to look at to help us understand how well we're doing. Okay. This is our error in the signal to noise thing. This is the noise. And so we want our error to be small. So the null model implies that you can't predict y any better than guessing the mean for each group. So let's scroll down here. Okay, this is the main idea of, of, the, of the model. And it actually talks a little bit about the math here, but focus on the picture. So the null model is the intercept only model where we just say, you know what? Everyone's score can be predicted with a mean of y. I don't need any of these x variables. And as we can see in this, this uh, line here, we predict everybody at this. So the dotted lines up to the dot are our residuals, our error term. And we would assume that this model is not very good. So that's the null model. The alternative model implies you can predict y by including the predictor. So we include the predictor. Now we take our, our flat line of prediction and uh, change it based on the weight of X. So we're, we're turning the slope here. We assume the slope is not flat. Slopes of zero are not predictive. So it's you know either positive or negative, but it's not zero. <laughs> and look how much closer to the dots that we've gotten. So we're assuming that the the residual terms, the error is going to be reduced by getting closer to the dots and turning up the slope. And so by including our predictive variables, you decrease the error between the actual y's and the predicted y. And then we actually call, also calculate our, our model or for the signal to noise ratio. So this is the signal part. 
Um, so how much better do we get by including the variable divided by how much error is still left? Okay. So in, a, in this scenario, what we're saying is here's how much of the variance I can account for by including this predictor. So how much better did I get by changing the slope divided by how much better could I still get? Okay, how much error is still left? And this mathematically is called least squares. So we're, we're finding the regression equation that creates the least squared error. And a oh, well, preview for this slide. The idea for that right here is that you find you find the spot mathematically where we just can't like tweak and turn the slope. Right? We can't bend the slope because this is a straight line regression, but we're just like tweaking the slope until we can get the smallest squared error. Okay. And that is a solvable equation. It's uh, called a closed form solution, meaning there's one answer here uh, that we're gonna let R do, right? But um, we're using that error size to determine if our model with predictors is better than no predictors. So we're looking at the reduction in error as our model divided by the error still left. And that question is essentially this idea of R squared is greater than zero. Okay. Because R squared, like can't be negative. <laughs> so as zero implies I have predicted nothing, no variance, okay, no model, <laughs> all noise, just no signal. Okay. And an R squared that gets larger and larger, closer to one, tells me that I'm getting better and better at predicting people's scores. Okay, so an R squared of zero means it can't predict at all. R squared of one means I predict perfectly. That is an unlikely scenario, but we want higher scores. And the, the real thing here that you have to think about is the field that you're working in, right? So I'm in social science. <laughs> so many times an R squared of 0.04 is like, woohoo, because people are hard to predict. They do funny things. In some of my other research fields, if I didn't hit an R squared of 0.6, then I'm not doing very well. Okay. And then once you get into machine learning models, R squared needs to be really high. So it just really, really depends on the field what kind of R squared is important, okay. practically interesting. For statistical significance, right, our P, our P value and null hypothesis testing, this is just testing it against zero. Okay. And uh, small R squares can be different from zero. So we always have to keep in mind what is practically important for what I'm doing. Okay. All right, now when I flip over from looking at my model as the equation to my predictor as the equation, this is a t-test, which is what correlation was as well. Okay. And the t-test formula is that slope divided by the standard error for that slope. Okay, so signal to noise is that slope and it's technically B minus something. Okay. And so it's the difference in the slope from predicted. Well, that's implicitly zero. Okay. And so we're seeing, is this value different from zero? Now this is a t-test, so we could pick a side on our hypothesis testing. We could say, I only care if B is greater than zero. So your null hypothesis is that B is equal to or less than zero. But generally people leave this as a two-tailed test with the assumption that I'm interested in um, if B is different from zero. So you're not hedging your bets, you don't pick a side. But often people are interested, they are really actually interested in a direction, but we just say, you know what, let's not pick a side and see what happens. So hence the formula, it's technically B minus your predicted B, which in this case, or your null B, sorry, um, which is often assumed to be zero. All right, so the model is our predictor. The error is our standard error. And this is a single sample t-test that tells us if B is different from zero. And so we might use these kinds of hypotheses. X variable does not predict Y. So now we're narrowing in. In the first set of hypotheses, I said, I cannot predict Y with all of these variables. 
Now we're doing one at a time. So I cannot predict y with this variable. And this might seem like we're just kind of being very particular, but there are instances when you're more interested in the overall model predicting than you are the individual predictors and vice versa. So it's important to, to me to investigate both halves because you could have a model that is a predictive, but again, none of the predictors are significant. Now this is pretty rare. It means that the model's you know, only predicting a little bit. Um, more likely what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a model that predicts and then one of the variables is really good or two of the variables are really good. And in a perfect world, all of our variables are great, but in reality, that doesn't, doesn't always work out. So H1 would be, um, or your alternative hypothesis would be that it does predict. And we could use a directional test where we could say the X variable negatively here does not predict zero. Okay. So this would be my null hypothesis or my alternative hypothesis would be that B does predict zero positively. Okay. Now to do this type of test, you kind of have to like um, take the output you get from R or any statistical program and kind of change the p-values because the, the assumption when it prints out is that it's a two-tailed test. But we could also take the values that we know we have and use R to do a single sample directional t. So, you know, there's a couple different alternatives, but I will, I just want to make it clear that most of the com computational programs assume the first one here, that you're only, you know, you're interested in the two-tailed version. All right, so unlike correlation for better or worse, these statistics are reported with their degrees of freedom. Okay. And the degrees of freedom in a regression equation are the sample size or the is, is. <laughs> there's actually two degrees of freedom, but for T there's only one, okay. Is the sample size minus K minus one, okay. Where N is the total sample size K is the number of predictors, and we have our one, K okay, for the mean. So correlation is technically in minus one minus one because it's a simple linear regression okay, where, you know, we kind of talked about this as one for X, one for Y, but um, the idea is that it's a one, a regression model with one predictor. And the easy thing is I don't have to think about this too hard because it's in the output by actually looking at the F statistic. And so it's the second number in the F statistic. Now the F statistic actually has two sets of degrees of freedom based on the number of predictors and the sample size. The T test, since the, we've gone to one predictor, right, for our um, individual predictor is more focused on the sample size. Now, the last thing I want to cover for this particular video before we move on to the next one is standardization. And then the next one, we'll get into some examples and like kind of work out how this works. So B, our slope that we've been talking about is our unstandardized regression coefficient. Okay, this is in the scale of the data. And the interpretation is for every one unit increase in X, there are B unit increases in Y. Okay, so if let's say I'm trying to predict students' scores. So a million years ago, we did this research study where we looked at supplemental instruction. This is a program that many universities offer where a student who has previously taken the course sits in on the course, models good student behavior, they take notes, okay, and then holds special tutoring sessions outside of class where they go over what's happened in class and give examples and, um, and basically help others who are struggling. And we did a study looking at supplemental instruction, trying to see what predicts students' scores. Well, we had to control for a bunch of stuff, right? Previous GPA is a really strong predictor of what they're gonna make in the class. <laughs> So after we dealt with that, we looked at how many sessions did they go to? And having the variable in the scale of the data really is impactful. Because what we were able to say to people as part of our advertising gimmick is that for every 10 sessions, that's once a week, basically in a regular semester, 
students were uh, on average, their letter grades were a half a letter grade higher. Okay. So for every one unit increase in X, there were B unit increases in Y. So for every session, they got 0 0.05 in their letter grade, but that's not as compelling to students. So we did it as for every 10 sessions, there are, it's about a half a letter grade, but the coefficient was 0 0.05. So for every one session they went to, they got 0 0.05 which translates into our gimmicky for every 10 sessions you go to, you get a half a letter grade. Okay. But then you, you give them that as a conceptually, that makes sense. Like, oh, if I go about once a week, my score should go up. Now that requires them to actually go and to actually study, but in general, that's how these models work. It's a generalization of the data. Now we could standardize this. And standardizing it changes this to beta. Beta is in standard B. It's a B score in standard deviation units. So guess what? That's a Z score. So we're going to Z score our whole regression. Once you do that, you lose the Y intercept. Okay, you force the Y intercept to be zero. And then the interpretation becomes for every one standard deviation increase in X, there are <clears throat> beta standard deviation increases in y. Okay, that should actually have the little symbol there. Okay. That's a lot harder to interpret, just like brain-wise. Like I couldn't even tell you what that meant. If I said that to my, under, you know, the undergrads at our institution, they'd just be like, what? Okay. And so, um, you know, the purpose of a standardized coefficient is often for comparison purposes. So once I standardize them, maybe I have five or six coefficients and they're all in different scales. This puts them all on the same scale. So now I can compare coefficients to each other within the same regression and compare co coefficients across regressions. So beta has its use. Okay, so which one should I use? Well, you should use B for a specific, an interpretation, thinking about what the, the predictor actually tells you within the confines of that study. And use beta when you are comparing different variables in the same that are in different scales or comparing across studies. Because even the same variable across studies can have its issues. So, so standardization to control for the sample is important. Okay. So let's stop there because this is where our example starts. I'll see you in the next video where we're going to talk about the nuances of data screening with regression.